Hello YouTube, this is CN Maritime History here back again with another video. Today we will be talking about the USS William D. Porter, World War II's unluckiest ship. The William D. Porter was laid down on the 7th of May 1942 at Orange in Texas, the United States, by the Consolidated Steel Corporation. She was launched on the 27th of September 1942, sponsored by Miss Mary Elizabeth Reeder and commissioned on July 6, 1943. Lieutenant Commander Wilford yeah, I said that right. A. Walter in command. The ship is predominantly remembered today for the string of extremely unfortunate events that plagued her short three-year career during World War II. William D. Porter departed Orange shortly after being commissioned. After stops at Galveston and Algiers, the destroyer headed for Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, on the 30th of July, 1943, for a shakedown cruise. She completed her shakedown a month later, and following a brief stop at Bermuda, continued on the Charleston, South Carolina, where she arrived on September the 7th. Porter completed post-shakedown repairs at Charleston and got underway for Norfolk, Virginia at the end of the month. For about five weeks, the warship operated, conducting battle practice with the USS Intrepid, which is currently in New York City if you want to visit that as a museum ship, and then the ships of the Atlantic Fleet. On November 12, 1943, she departed Norfolk to rendezvous with the USS Iowa, BB-61. That battleship was on her way to North Africa, carrying President Franklin D. Roosevelt, to the, to the Cairo and Tehran conferences. William D. Porter was reported to have been involved in a mishap while departing Norfolk when her anchor tore the railing and lifeboat mounts off a dock sister destroyer while maneuvering astern. The next day, a depth charge from the deck of the Porter fell into the rough sea and exploded, causing USS Iowa and the other escort ships to take evasive maneuvers under the assumption that the task force had come under torpedo attack by a German U-boat. Ship's logs from William D. Porter in Iowa do not mention a lost depth charge nor a U-boat search on the 13th of November. Both logs do mention that William D. Porter experienced a boiler tube failure on the number 3 boiler, causing the ship to fall out of position in formation until the number 4 boiler was brought online. At Roosevelt's request on November the 14th, Iowa conducted an anti-aircraft kill to demonstrate her ability to defend herself. A number of balloons were released for use as targets. While most of these were shot by gunners aboard Iowa, a few of them drifted towards William D. Porter, which shot down balloons as well. Porter, along with the other escort ships, also demonstrated a torpedo drill by simulating a launch at Iowa. This drill suddenly went Ari. I think I said that right. Anyway, it means, like, really bad, in case you don't know. When a live torpedo discharged to mountain number two aboard William D. Porter and headed straight towards Iowa. William D. Porter attempted to signal Iowa about the inco um, incoming torpedo, but owing to orders to maintain radio silence using the signal lamp instead, whoever the destroyer first must identify the direction of the torpedo and then relayed the, the wrong message, informing Iowa that Porter was backing up, rather than that a torpedo was in the water. In desperation, the destroyer finally broke radio silence using code words that relayed a warning message to Iowa regarding the incoming torpedo. After Confirming the identity of the destroyer, Iowa turned hard to avoid being hit by the torpedo. Roosevelt, meanwhile, had learned of the incoming torpedo threat and asked his Secret Service attendee to move his wheelchair to the side of the battleship so he could see. In my opinion, if that torpedo had struck, that would have been very bad for President Roosevelt. Not long afterward, the torpedo detonated in the ship's wake, some 3,000 yards astern of the Iowa, or behind. Iowa was unhurt, but as a result of this friendly fire incident, ships would routinely greet the destroyer with the hail. By the way, don't take this offensive, this is what they said. Don't shoot, we're Republicans. I assume this is because FDR was a Democrat, if I'm not mistaken? I don't know. The entire incident lasted about four minutes from torpedo firing at 1436 to detonation at 1440. Following these events, the ship and her crew were ordered to Bermuda for an inquiry into the Iowa affair. Chief Torpedoman Lawton Dawson, whose failure to remove the torpedo's primer had enabled it to fire at Iowa. He was later sentenced to hard labor, though President Roosevelt intervened in this case as the incident had been an accident. On December the 29th, William D. Porter arrived in Dutch Harbor on the island of Unalaska and joined Task Force 94. Between the 2nd and the 4th of January 1944, she voyaged from Dutch Harbor to a dock, where she conducted training operations until her departure for Hawaii on the 7th. The warship entered Pearl Harbor on January 22nd and remained there until the 1st of February, at which time the destroyer put the sea again to escort USS Black Hawk to a dock. The two ships arrived at the destination nine days later, and Porter began four months of relatively uneventful duty with Task Force 94. 
She sailed between the various islands in the Aleutians' chain, serving primarily as an anti-submarine escort. Commander Charles M. Keyes, Lieutenant Commander Walters, commanding officer on the 30th of May, 1944. On the 10th of June, the destroyer stood up out to and headed for the Kuril Islands. She and the other ships of Task Force 94 reached their destination early on the morning of the 13th. They started to shell their target, the island of Matsuwa, at 5.13. After 20 minutes, William D. Porter's radar picked up an unidentified service vessel, closing her port quarter a speed in excess of 55 knots. In conver converting that to kilometers an hour, that's 100, which is very fast for a ship. Her radar personnel tentatively identified the craft as an enemy PT-type boat. Now, I'm not sure if that's really fast for a ship, but for the ocean liners that I study, that is very fast. And the warship ceasefire and Matsuwa had hit a new target under fire. Soon thereafter, the craft's reflection disappeared from the radar screen, presumably the victim of Task Force 94's gunfire. Not long afterward, the Task Force completed its mission and retired from the crew wheels to retire to re refuel at Atu. On June 24, the destroyer left Atu with Task Force 94 for a second mission in the Kugels. Following two days at sea and steadily increasing fog, she arrived off Paramushi Road on the 26th. In the dense fog of visibility down to about 200 yards, she delivered her gunfire, then departed with Task Force 94 to return to the Aleutians. A month of training and exercises intervened between her second and third voyages to the Kugels. On August 1st, she cleared Kuluk Bay for her final bombardment of the Kugels. By the second day out, excuse me, an enemy twin engine bomber snooped on the task force and received a hail of fire from some of the screening destroyers. It proved to be the only noteworthy event of the mission because the following day the bombardment was cancelled due to poor weather and the enemy reconnaissance plane. William D. Porter dropped anchor in Massacre Bay at Altu on the 4th of August. Though William D. Porter arrived in the Western Pacific too late to participate in the actual invasion at Leakey Gulf, Combat conditions persisted there after her arrival in San Pedro Bay. Soon after she anchored, their Japanese planes swooped in to attack the ships in the anchorage. First plane fell to the guns of a nearby destroyer before reaching Porter's effective range. A second intruder appeared, however, and the destroyer's five-inch guns joined those of the assembled transports and bringing him to a fiery end in midair. For the remainder of the year, William D. Porter escorted ships between Leyte, Hollandia, Manus, Bougainville, and Mindoro. On the 21st of December, while steaming from Leyte to Mindoro, she encountered enemy air power once again. Two planes made steep glides and dropped several bombs near the convoy. The destroyer opened up with her main battery almost as soon as the enemies appeared, but to no avail. Their bombs missed the targets by a wide margin, but the two Japanese aircraft apparently suffered no damage and made the good their escape. Not long thereafter, four more airborne intruders attacked. Porter concentrated her fire on the two nearest her, one of which fell to her anti-aircraft fire. The second succumbed to the com combined efforts of other nearby destroyers and remaining two presumably retired to safety. From then until midnight, enemy aircraft shattered the convoy, but none displayed temerity enough to attack. Before dawn the following morning, she had countered and destroyed a heavily laden but abandoned enemy landing barge. After completing her screening mission to Mindoro, Porter returned to San Pedro Bay on the 26th of December to begin preparations for the invasion of Luzon. I realize this video is longer than some of mine, so I'm just going to skip a few parts. Okay, here we go. Sorry, they just the original take for this video was about 12 minutes long, so I wanted to keep it to 10 minutes or so. After returning briefly to Lingay and Gulf, William D. Porter moved on to Leyte to prepare for the assault on Okinawa. She remained at Leyte during the first half of March, then joined the gunfire support unit attached to the Western Islands Attack Group for a week of gunnery practice at Kabuvin Island. She departed the Philippines on the 21st of March, reached the Ryukyu Islands on the morning of the 25th. I probably just butchered that, but... And began supporting the virtually unopposed occupation of Karama Retu. Between 25th March and the 1st of April, she provided the anti-aircraft and anti-submarine protection for the ships in the Kirama Roadstead while performing some fire support duties in response to what little resistance the troops met ashore on the uh, on the islets of Kirama Reto. However, by the time the main assault on Okinawa began on the morning of the 1st of April, she had been reassigned to Task Force 54, Rear Admiral Morton L. Deo's gunfire and covering force. 
During her association with that task organization, William D. Porter rendered fire support for the troops conquering Okinawa, provided anti-submarine and anti-aircraft defenses for the larger warships of Task Force 94, and it protected minesweepers during their operations. Between the 1st of April and the 5th of May, she expended in excess of 8,500 rounds of 5-inch shells, both at short targets and in enemy aircraft during the almost incessant aerial attacks on the invasion force. During that period, she added 5 additional plane kills to her tally. At some point during the early part of the Battle of Okinawa, William D. Porter accidentally damaged USS Luce, DD-522. On June 10, 1945, William D. Porter fell victim to a unique, though fatal, kamikaze attack. Also, by the way, while I remember this, I'm not sure what the big thing is in the picture right next to William D. Porter. I believe that's like some sort of smear in the old photograph, but I'm pretty sure that thing that's out there next to the Porter, I believe that's some sort of landing barge, just to let you guys know. Okay, back to the video. On June 10th, 1945, she fell victim to a kamikaze attack, like I said. At 8.15 that morning, an obsolete Aichi D-3A bow dive bomber dropped unheralded out of the clouds and made straight for the warship. The destroyer managed to evade the suicide plane and it, sm and it splashed down in the water nearby her. Somehow, I don't know how this is even remotely possible because you know, they're not depth chargers, they're just regular bombs, but somehow the explosive laid plane ended up beneath Porter right before it exploded. So yeah, the plane exploded, it pretty much sealed the Porter's sentence. Suddenly the warship was lifted out of the water and then dropped back again due to the force of the underwater blast. She lost power and suffered broken steam lines. Now I'll be honest with you, I don't know what a steam line is to be honest, like since steam pretty much powered everything on board the ship, I mean, there was some electricity, but depending on when the ship was made, uh, you could have electricity, but most of it was powered by steam. They could have your steam power generators. For example, Titanic did have a generator, but it was powered by steam. Okay. A number of fires also broke out. For three hours, her crew struggled to put out the fires, repair the damage, and keep the ship afloat. The crew's efforts were in vain, and 12 minutes after the order to abandon ship went out, William D. Porter heeled over to starboard and sank by the stern. Miraculously, her crew suffered no fatal injuries. The warship's name was struck from the naval, re naval vessel register on 11th July 1945. She received four battle stars for her service in World War II. So in this photo, several series of photographs, you can see the Porter sinking as it progresses. Now, I don't know what... In the first picture, the 122 is, but the quarters of the ship in the background. And it says, on June 10, 1945, she was attacked by a Japanese kamikaze plane. It only managed a near miss, but its bomb apparently passed on the ship before exploding. Now, according to the site I used as a source, the entire plane was underneath it when it exploded, so I'm not sure which to follow, but that was the best one I could find. It led to underwater damage or the flooding that could not be controlled after three hours of damage control efforts. Which is odd, because this is three hours, and this, and what I have, the source I have, oh, I see, so three hours after the impact, but only 12 minutes after the order of abandoned ship, gotcha, I almost did not realize that, but I understand now. So, it says after damage control efforts for three hours, she capsized and sank. She did not lose any of her crew, no fatal injuries, but some injuries were sustained, yes. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video about the William D. Porter. One of my friends has been asking for it for quite some time, so I decided to um, give that to him. Um, I hope you guys have a good day, have a good weekend, happy Halloween, and have a good day. Bye.